Welcome to Fitz Dog Radio, Jersey style. Here we are, Rutherford, New Jersey, home of the uh, Giants, uh, the New Jersey Devils. I don't know who else plays at Rutherford Giants Stadium. But anyway, I just got done with some shows. I'm sitting in my hotel room and digging you guys tuning in. Thanks, cats. Um, heading into the city now, actually. I finished my show, and I'm going to jump in an Uber and go to the Upper West Side and meet my wife, who is flying in with the kids from California. She's touching down around now, so we're going to have rendezvous. And then have a little week in New York and do some spots in New York City at the Comedy Cellar and the Stand. By the time you hear this, um, the spots will be tonight and tomorrow. If you're around, come check me out. That'll be the 7th, 8th, 9th, the 10th and 11th of August. And then I got some other dates coming up I'll get to later. But right now, uh, I just finished watching Olympics all day. That I, I'll tell you what, I love watching the Olympics, but I get I get very stressed out because I know that these people make no fucking money. They sacrifice everything. They train their asses off for years, all for this one moment. Like you watch these these relay races where they drop the baton and all four guys are just fucked over all that training all that sacrifice over because one little slip of the hand oh it's oh and i know i watched the gymnastics i was a gymnast i don't know if you guys know that about me but i was a very serious gymnast for about seven years when i was a kid not very serious but i did it on a regular basis i did two or three days a week i trained after school and then um, I, I was I was a flipping I was a flipping fool. I would flip off of anything. When I was a kid, my parents knew I was at the. They sent me to the YMCA in our town, and I was um, I was tearing it up. And they said you should send this kid somewhere good because he's got a lot of potential. I was I weighed about nine pounds, soaking wet. So I was and I, I was short, so it was easy for me to flip to throw my body weight around, and I was fearless. I was a lunatic. No flexibility. Couldn't even touch my ankles. That was my, that's what held me back. I had no form, but I would do anything they told me to do. I was like a crack whore. And then I went to this place called the Roma Athletic Club in White Plains, which was this training thing, and there was a guy there, Bruce, and he was the... Uh, he was like a serious gymnast himself, and so he kind of like, it was all girls. I was the only guy that was taking the gymnastics classes. It was just me and a bunch of little girls. And so this guy Bruce would like, you know, he'd help me out, and he'd teach me all the male stuff because they had a pommel horse, they had rings, and so we would go on them, and he would he would flip me in the air. I was doing double back flips. By the time I was like 11 years old, I was doing double double backs. I was doing back folds, uh, front front flips, Russian lift. All I did it all. And this is back when the floor exercise. By the way, what you're seeing today, the, these people are doing they're doing a trampoline. The floor exercise has springs under it. It's it's soft and it's springy. The what I worked on was it was like a rubber. It was about a half an inch of rubber on top of concrete. So we would do flips, and if you landed it wrong, I can't tell you how much of my childhood I had ace bandages wrapped around my ankles, constantly slamming them. I flew off a trampoline in the middle of a flip, and I landed on my foot. My ass landed on top of my foot under, under me, and I broke my foot. It's still, to this day, I wake up in the morning and I hobble to the toilet. It's like my recurring injury. And uh, and I never got my period as a kid because of doing so much gymnastics. It, you know, what it got me in was the school play. There was a, we did a school play and I was in like seventh grade and they had me do uh, backflips across the stage and then they had me walk around on my hands, and I was a, I, oh, it was a big crowd favorite. They loved it. 
And then my friends made fun of me. So in seventh grade, I found drugs. We started smoking a lot of pot and drinking in seventh grade, and I stopped doing gymnastics like a fool. And I was, I was working out with the high school team when I was in seventh grade. But uh, I dropped out of all of it because I was shamed by my friends who said I was a fag. Can you imagine that? But I, w- I was a flippin' fool. Jesus. Speaking of better health, a big part of your health is how, how do you start your day? What's the first thing you put in, the, in your body in the morning? Is it some sugary, horrible cereal that, that just makes you crash and gives you a belly? Not anymore, folks. Magic Spoon. These delicious cereals, they sent me a whole bunch of free samples, and my kids liked them so much, I asked for more, and we've gotten more. And uh, the best part about it is it's like amazing flavors. They're the same flavors that you would have gotten as a kid, like Cocoa Krispies, Fruit Loops, all those good flavors. They have them, but they've got zero grams of sugar. They've got 13 to 14 grams of protein per serving with only four net grams of carbs. Um, it's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, and low carb. Variety pack. Four flavors are cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. I mean, I can't tell you how much I love this stuff, and you can eat it morning, noon, and night. I, I grab it as a snack before I work out. Go to magicspoon.com slash Greg, G R E G, to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code GREG at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. You know what questions they'll ask you? None. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash greg. Use the code greg to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. We appreciate that. Other plugs, I'll be coming to you, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Dr. Grin's a very fun club. I will be at August 19th through the 21st. I will then be at the Buffalo Rose Club in Golden, Colorado, outside of Denver on August 26th through the 28th. And the Punchline San Francisco, no, Punchline Sacramento, September 30th through October 2nd. And I think we're going to do a Sunday Papers taping on that show. So uh, get your tickets for all of those at fitzdog.com. All right, I'm very excited about my guest today. She came in this week, and I just fell in love with her. I've always loved her comedy. I always had a feeling that we would click, and we really did. And I think she's a really special person and a, and a powerhouse performer. She's got this show called The Ms. Pat Show that is on BET Plus uh, starting on the 12th of August. And we're going to talk about that a lot. But she, but you've probably seen her. She had a special on Netflix. The De, she was on the, the Degenerate series. She was on This Is Not Happening. She was on Last Comic Standing. She's been on Rogan a bunch of times, Marin's podcast a bunch of times, Bert Kreischer's. Anyway, she's, she's a veteran comic who's put in her hours, and she's got a story to tell that is going to blow you guys away. I know you'll love it. So uh, put on your seatbelts, folks. Pour yourself some Magic Spoon and kick back and enjoy my chat with Ms. Pat. Welcome, Ms. Pat. Hey, Greg. Thank you for having me. Are you shitting me? I've wanted to have you on for so long. This is this is really great for me. I know. When we was, I was talking to someone, I was like, I think we passed each other, but we really never met. Well, I've watched you. I've sat in the back of the comedy store and watched the, the hurricane that rolls in when you get on stage. It's always <laughs> exciting. So you just bring it every time. Thank you. I try. I try. Yeah. I mean, even on those little sets, you still bring it. You don't. Know, you play it like your headline in a room in uh, Vegas. Uh one day. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those five minutes at the comedy store. I appreciate it. It's stage time. I can get to be honest with you. You're right. And it's also like a connection for you because I know um, 
part of uh, your success now is coming from your exposure from some of the podcasts that come out of the comedy store, Rogan's and Kreischer's, and that kind of that kind of exposed you to a different audience than you were probably uh, used to. Uh, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Po- the, the podcast world was my Johnny Carson. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, is that right? It started with Mar- Marin and uh, even before that, uh, Eddie Iff was the first one I ever done. Did you do it in his uh, Volkswagen van? No, no, no. It was before the Volkswagen. Mm-hmm. I did it at his house. In and, Venice? Yes. And it was the first time I did it and I thought they was crazy. Yeah. I was like, what the hell is a podcast? And these white boys have lost their damn mind. <laughs> <laughs> they was, they, it was the weirdest thing. I'm not, I'm black and I'm sitting there with all these young white boys yeah. playing with themselves, jumping on each other. I was like, what the hell is going on? Is this what a podcast is? I thought it was the, I left yeah. that thinking like, what the fuck did I just yeah, do? Right, right. And from Eddie Ilf, it just started, you know, traveling. Up. Next thing you know, a bird and, and then Mark Marin and Rogan and yeah. just kept going. But right. that first one was Eddie If, and I thought it was the craziest shit I ever seen in my life. Is that when he was doing it with Jim Jeffries? Because he used to, it used to be him and Jim and like two other lunatics down he, in Venice Beach. Yeah, but it was at his house. Yeah, and, um, right. He was getting ready to get married. Uh-huh. Uh, Jim Jeffrey wasn't there. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. think that's when they was like, kind of like on their own. Right. And I, that's the podcast I, I done with Eddie. It was crazy. Right. Right. Yeah. Didn't know what the hell a podcast was. Eddie literally said somebody listened to Eddie podcast, and I live in Indiana. Uh-huh. So he said, "I want somebody with some real stories. I want some interesting shit." Yeah. And so. I'm working the box office at the comedy club because you know at the, the comedy store. No, in in, in Indiana, it's oh, called okay. Morty's Comedy. Morty, sure, store. yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm working at box office, uh-huh. and um, you know, one of the other local comedians like Eddie really this this guy named Eddie got a podcast. He wants some real stories, so I wrote in and told him you should meet Miss Pat. Yeah, and he's like, who the hell is Miss Pat? Yeah, and they set it up, and I flew out to L. A. Yeah, I'm oh, no kidding. I just flew out here, didn't know shit about no podcast, had never heard of Eddie Ilf. Never really dealt with white comics before. Yeah. And I did Eddie Elf, and the train just started to go. No kidding. Yeah. And did you notice it on social media? Did you have different people starting to, like, holler not, at you? Not right away. No. I noticed my social media went crazy after I did Rogan. And, yeah. And, um, well, Burt Kreischer, it, it started to jump in uh, Ari, but it really went crazy when I did Rogan. Yeah. And Marin. All right. That's when I really noticed a different cause. You know, the word on the street was, if you get on Joe Rogan, you're going to become famous. Uh-huh. That was the words on the street. Yeah. And I, was, I kept telling my manager at the time, I was like, they say if I get on, on Joe Rogan, I'm going to be famous. Right. And he was like, what the hell is a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but I got on Marin first, which yeah. was so weird because after I did Marin, the next week I had seven studio meetings. To no. try to develop a sitcom. And really? then the following week, I did Rogan, and then everything just like went off the chart, like as far as fans. But yeah, I did Mark Marin. I, Mark Marin released my podcast when we was in the midst of selling my book to it. And I sold my book that day. No shit. Yeah. Oh, you mean you were out trying to get somebody no, to no, buy No, no, we no. We, we released the, uh, what the book was about to okay. different companies. Oh, you're true. And yeah. we released Marin. That week, and, and I that, sold it and that book. created interest in buying the book. Mm-hmm. No, my shit. story on Marin. That's how Whoa. I ended up with Run Howard Company. Uh, imagine they're yeah. they're attached to my sitcom, right? Because one of the his ex there was listening to my story on Marin. Yeah, and couldn't get out of the car. Get out of here! And he was one of that was one of the seven companies that I met with. Jesus. And then when I get when I got on Rogan, it just certified it. Yeah. And I still didn't know what the hell a podcast was. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, just a couple of white boys talking behind a mic. I don't got time for that <laughs> shit. I got laundry to do. You know, I'm a mama. I got shit to do. I don't sit here and entertain nobody behind no damn mic. <laughs> There's no audience. I can't sell my CD after the show. What is this shit? Yeah. I mean, I I just, I didn't, I really didn't understand it. But yeah. what I did was I just said, I think something is here. And at the time I had a manager and I know, I mean, I'm I'm from the streets. I know when something is there. Right. I know. I know when I'm dealing with something that could, could get a little bit bigger. Yeah. And so my manager was like, you can't keep flying out here to do these podcasts. You know, they're kind of useless. And I was like, no. What, what I knew, I was different from all the other 
comedians that they were bringing on. I was something different because I had been shot in the head. I had been shot in the teeth. Yeah. My story had never been out there before. Yeah. And I was like, well, the story I'm telling they had never heard before. Right. So I know I'm, I'm different. That's right. And he was like, no, no. And I flew to New York to meet Ari Shafir. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that was weird as fuck. I love him to death. Yeah. Now. That's my baby. But I get there and um, me and Ari, Ari looking at me outside. And I'm like, what the fuck wrong with you? He said, well, <laughs> I thought you was going to be real big, black and loud. I said, what the fuck <laughs> that's supposed to mean? <laughs> the fuck that's supposed to mean, all right? I mean, what, what if I said some shit like that about Jews? <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Yeah. I thought you were going to be hanging yeah, on the cross. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you kill Jesus? <laughs> Me, what, I'm like, what kind of shit is that? But that's why I love him, because he's so fucking honest. <laughs> and we just bunted in that park yeah, that day. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I ended up on his storytelling show. Oh, the... Um, um, this is not happening. This is not happening, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're perfect for that show. Yeah, we I ended up on that show, and they wasn't for sure if they wanted me on the on the show or just the internet. I remember Ari coming back saying, well, they really don't have no space for you on the TV show, but the internet version lasts forever. And I said to myself, you got me fucked up. Yep. Anybody got these stories? I'm going to get on that motherfucking TV show. Yeah. So I just smiled. I said, okay, that's okay. I'm thankful for being on the internet. And I walked and said, watch this motherfucker. And I told a story, and I ended up on the fucking nice. show. Nice. <laughs> what was the story that you told? Um, I mean, um, not the whole thing, but what was but the broad just getting strokes? losing my nipple in a drive-by. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. Guy shot my nipple off in uh-huh. the drive-by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That doesn't happen on most podcasts. You don't hear those stories on on podcasts. Well, not real ones anyway. Yeah, right. Because I've been abused to death. Right, but right. Like, but like I said, the podcast industry has been like my Johnny Carson. Damn. So, so you end up selling the book. You end up making a deal with Brian Brian Grazier. Yeah, and, Brian uh, Grazier, and Lee Daniels. That's what it was. Lee Daniels. It was the first year Empire Shit. was on TV. Well, I actually I went somewhere else because I didn't like the Zeke, and then. It just so happened a deal was up with the other new regency, and they called and said Lee Daniel wants to a comedy with a with a, a black woman yeah. as a lead. Right, and you know I don't know if you know black sitcom, but there haven't been one in a long fucking time. No, it's been ever since the CW stopped making them. They, well, it was never was a black woman. Right, you know it was always a daddy. Right. There was a lead, or you know Dia Hughley, uh, uh, the Wayne's brothers. I don't right. know the last time they had a black woman as a lead. Yeah, because that think. was a Monique show. Now, you know, that was her daughter's show. So, right. Did Retta ever have one? Who was isn't there a woman named Retta who had yeah, a show? She, she, I don't think she ever had one. No, damn. Uh, Theo Vidal, Theo Vidal is oh, the last right, one I can right, remember. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so, um, we I hooked up with new, I hooked up with Imagine and Lee Daniel, and it took five years, but we're here. No, shit. yes, it took five years. Now, let me ask you this. On these development deals, they they buy you basically for a year. Mm-hmm. So did they keep buying you every they year? Kept, you know, I was you lucky. You kept getting as a fuck. check every year. <laughs> I was lucky because you know one or two times, and they like that's it. This yeah, shit gonna work. Right. I went through three fucking writers and three right. deals. Right. So yes, and you people don't, don't know. Have... There's people living in mansions in Hollywood that have never had their face on the screen, but they had deals. Yes, because people thought they were hot. They got a good story. There's something here. Someone believes in them. They throw money at them, and it just for whatever the machinations of Hollywood bro- being a broken toy, it doesn't come out. Yeah. So you got you got three deals out of it. I did. I got three deals out of it. That's the and, way. And you know, I was like, oh, this shit is never going. Then when Hulu shot the pilot. You know, you know, oh shit, Hulu picked it up because it was a Fox show, right? And it went from Fox to you know to Fox uh to Fox Studio, and yeah. then that's part, that's like the little edgier part, Fox Studio, yeah. I think. And then after that, we went, we sold it to Hulu. Yeah. And then we everybody was like, oh my god, it's a home run with Hulu. And I just have these feelings that I go by, and people people think I'm crazy, but I know when people are full of shit. Yeah. And I know when. People are not being honest. I just have the, it's, I call them spirits. And I remember shooting a pilot and I said, I was telling the guy who I created a show with, Jordan Cooper, I said, then I got him pick it up. Yeah. While we were shooting the pilot. Yeah. He said, what are you talking about? This shit is funny. They're like, I said, they're not going to pick it up. And he's like, and, and I tried to tell the other producer, but nobody would listen to me. I said, the execs don't get it. It was yeah. one exec that didn't get it. Right. And I felt his spirit and it, we could never connect. Mm. 
And people thought I was crazy. I was running around and literally telling them, they're not going to pick this up. Yeah. They're not going to pick this up. And it was, it, I mean, it was 250 some people in the audience. It was a killer night. Debbie yeah. Allen shot the pilot. Brian Gray's are there. It was like a dream country, but I knew in my heart that Hulu was not going to pick this show right. up because they didn't understand the black mama we was trying to present. I'm not Claire Huxable. Yeah. I'm Miss Pat. Yeah. Why am I going to play like I chop vegetables? Nigga, I used to sell cocaine. <laughs> I don't chop no goddamn vegetables. You got a joke in the show about about selling cocaine. You go, uh, you're sitting on the plane and a woman says, you said, what are you doing? She says, I'm a geologist. <laughs> she goes, they're paying people to sell rocks. You said, I sold rocks and they, was it? They, they put me in jail. I sold crack rocks. I sold crack rocks. <laughs> 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 well, you watched the show, dude. Thank you. I watched that show. I I am in. I am ready Thank for. You. I'm ready for a season of that. It's just. It's like you said. It's not any character that I've seen in a sitcom before. It's like it's it's brutally honest. It's like you don't let up on the gas. I mean, you are in everybody's grill, and it's like. But you realize that's what this family needs. It needs one person who's calling everybody on their bullshit. Yeah. And you're that person. And it's, it's that's, and that's what I try to tell people. I said, it's it's real conversation. Like, literally, it's my whole first album, my whole first part of my career. Right. And that that scene on what you're talking about on a plane, yeah. I really used to do that. I used to fly Southwest before I got a deal. Greyhound would, with wings. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would block the seat off to have uncomfortable conversation <laughs> about life with white people. <laughs> Because I flew back to Indianapolis and nobody, everybody was white flying back to Indianapolis. Right, you right. might have had a few black people sprinkled here and there. Yeah. But the plane back then was always full of white people. Right. So I would have a, hey, what do you think about those black people got shot today? What the fuck? Oh, but they no don't have shit. those real conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would force them yeah. to have, and it was usually white men that I would block it all for. Right. Sometimes I would get white women, but I really wanted to like start a conversation with white men because uh-huh. they're the head of the household. Yeah. You know, and they're so scared everybody's trying to take their fucking place. So I would just block right. it off. And some I could get and some I couldn't. Yeah. Right. And right. but in the in the pilot we put a, a woman there and that whole geology thing, I'm at the I'm at the Looney Bin one night. Yeah. And I'm on stage and I asked one of the ladies in the audience, I said, I said, what do you do for a living? She said she's a geologist. I'm I mean, I grew up out of school in eighth grade. I'm no fucking dummy, but I don't know what the fuck no geology is. So yeah. I said, What the fuck is that? She's like, I study rocks. And I'm like, bitch, they get white people jobs studying rocks. <laughs> And <laughs> and I recorded all of my sets, and so I let the yeah. the creator listen to it. Yeah. I was like, it was just a bit. Yeah. I having a conversation right. that ended up in my fucking sitcom. Well, that's what the show feels like. It sometimes you see sitcoms with um, stand ups in them, and it feels like. This feels like a joke that was sandwiched into a show, mm-hmm. but yours feel like conversations that happened that they oh, put into a show. It flows. You. There's back and forth. And the guy that plays your husband, what's his name? Jay? Oh, his name Jay Bernard Calloway. Damn, he's good. He's from the stage. I was going to say, he's grounded. Yes. Yeah. He, everybody around me was really talented actors and actresses. Which helped me out as a comic because, you know, if you ain't been in the acting, you don't, I couldn't act. Right. And I even literally, when I sold the show the first time to Fox and everybody, like, yay, Brian Gray's and Lee Day, I said, excuse me, are you motherfuckers going to ask me, can I act? Yeah, right, right. I, I, I can't, they were like, you can't act? No, I'm a fucking comedian. Yeah. yeah. I'm not just going to take your money and then go out here and make an ass out of myself. Uh-huh. I mean, I need the money, right. but I also need a career after this bullshit. Yeah. So uh, thank God they was able to put me in a bunch of acting classes, but I was, I'm still not as strong as the cast. But the cast is so tight that they make it seem like I'm tighter than I, I think I really am. Well, I think they position you in a way where you're using your voice and they're not they're not putting you out of your your comfort zone. Yes. You, you know, you like I said, you're you're hammering people and, and it's just and you're a good listener. Good acting is just listening. Yes. And like you talk about being on these planes with people, like, listen and react. That's what Brando talks about. That's what De Niro talks about. It's about the ability to pay attention and get out of your own head and react naturally. And you do that in the show. Well, thank you. That's what I try. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good. Um, the uh, um, Your podcast, I want to talk about, uh, what is it called? The Pat the Pat, the pat Down. The Pat Down, which, which you do with my friend uh, Dion Curry. Yeah, yeah, he's scared to go on the road with you. Yeah, he opens for me yeah, on the road. That D- Dion was my first friend in Indiana. 
Is that I just right? left him. We just left Raleigh together. Oh, no kidding. Really? Yes. He was my first friend that I met the day I got to Indiana. Because wow. you, remember, you remember the guy, I can't say his name, but you remember the guy who used to run Morty's? Yeah. The black guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a whole episode on how he treated me. Oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure if you start in the box office, you didn't get a lot of respect on stage. <laughs> well, I didn't start in the box office. I didn't, I didn't get any respect at all. Just for some reason, you know, a person didn't like me. Yeah. And... I don't know why, you know, I was looking for guidance. I'm from Atlanta. I come from a very urban uh, setting. Yeah. You know, I started at Uptown Comedy and uh, I thought I was pretty funny. I mean, I'm a young comic. You, A lot of us think we're pretty good at five years, but I knew I had something there. And this person just totally rejected me when I got to Indy and treated me like crap. But I never gave up. So I said, you know how you get a person who's trying to shit on you? You treat them nice. Yeah, right. And I eventually got a job there, and I eventually got a night there called Bust a Good Thirsty with Miss Pat, a 10.30 show that was wall-to-wall with white kids from Purdue. He couldn't believe it. No shit. Oh, my God. It was packed out every Thursday night. These white kids up there, their, their, their parents, American Express card. Yeah. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> it was the weirdest They're Drinking shit. white claws and yeah. wearing eyes on shirts. white claws out back then. Yeah, right. It was when I first got to like 2008, 2009. Yeah. I mean, it was nothing but white kids coming out to see How me. long did it take you to build up that that following? About a, It took about a year. Yeah. Because I really, like, during the day, I would go out and pass. I flyers. No I was shit. And I was called. See, that's what I'm talking. Young comics want to know how can I make? Can you help me make it? No, you got to go ma- help oh. help yourself make it. Yeah, this shit is not easy. You got to I mean, grind. And Dion was there when I was grinding for this show. Yeah, I mean, I was literally great. He was paying me three hundred dollars. Uh-huh. Now he was packing the room sometime with discounted tickets or free tickets, but mostly discounted. But for he the was student. selling drinks. He though. was selling drinks. Pack on a, his his. He had a he had an eight o'clock show when nobody be there. The ten thirty show, the line would be at fucking dope. Mm-hmm. I was making three hundred. The comics were making more money than uh-huh. me. Yep. Yep. The comics were making more money Damn. than me. Yeah. But and then I remember Dion said, "Why do you do to see a piece of shitty treat?" I said, "I know what I'm doing." I know what I'm doing. You're logging your hours. Yeah, I'm. I know what I'm doing. I say. I say. I don't need. I do need the money at this time in my career. But he got something that I can't buy, which is stage time. Mm-hmm. And that's all I want to do is get better. Yeah. So I took a lot of bullshit. Yeah. I mean, I remember having a conversation with this person, and this person said. I said, I did a guest spot because you know it was in it was Carmel, so it was a white club. Yeah, you know it was in the white area. He said, "Well, my seven o'clock crowd would never get you you to ghetto," and that shit kicked me in my chest like a brick. Mm-hmm. And I went outside to my car and I w- I kind of cried. And I came back to the bar and his cousin was a bartender. He was like, um, "What's wrong with you, Miss Pass? I'm good." I said, I'm good. I said, because that's what he want me to do. He said all this ugly shit so he can run me away because he know there's no clubs in Indiana. Right. You know, this is one of the main clubs here. Yeah. So I said, okay. I said, okay. I said, well, when you think I'm ready, that's fine. So I just, I went to the club every weekend because I didn't have no rose gigs. I went to the club every weekend, Greg. Just sat in the back, kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything. So what happened was one day, Dear Hughley is running late. Mm, as he does. <laughs> <laughs> as he does. He was coming out of Chicago and it was a fucking snow, store, uh, okay. snowstorm. Yeah. And it was wall to wall packed. Yeah. And you know, once you get my my black people, they chicken and they hen and say they ready to fucking uh, land. We ain't yeah. be waiting over the extra 35, 40 minutes. Yeah. And he needed to fill those slots with some time. Uh-huh. And I'm sitting in the back. I don't say shit because I knew one day he was going to need me. Mm. He said, Can you go up and do about 10, 15 minutes? Dear Hughley is on the way. It's snowing. And, you know, Everybody now they don't they don't everybody don't order. I said, oh sure, I destroyed that yeah. bitch. As yeah. Dio walked in, he was like, who the fuck is that on stage? <laughs> and he was like, Miss Pay. He was like, oh, give us some more time during the week. And and then he couldn't say shit. He still tried to hold out. Cheryl Underwood came to town. I was like, how stupid can you be when you got a good comic here right. and you can start a night with this person and make you some fucking money? Oh, she put it in his head. Yeah, she put it in his head. She was, she was, cause she was, she very vocal. Yeah. She's like, you's a stupid motherfucker if you don't use this good comic right here. Yeah. And right after she left, I got that busted good Thursday. Wow. But but people people want to blow up and you know sometimes you just gotta keep getting kicked in the face until cause yeah. it's your dream. Right. Cause if you walk away and say, oh that person don't like me, then you're allowing them to kill your dream. And mm-hmm. I was not gonna allow that clown to kill my dream. Wow. 
That's how it was then, and that's how it is now. You get these deals that don't work out. Hulu doesn't like it. Let's try somewhere else. Just keep showing up. I was at, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina when Hulu dropped my pilot, and it took them six months to drop it, right? Yeah. But I knew they was going to drop it. And Lee Daniel called me, and uh, my phone blowing up. I get off the I said, what the hell is Lee doing? You know, it's like 9 o'clock at night in Raleigh. So I called. I picked up the phone. I said, what's wrong, Lee? He said, I'm so sorry. They, uh, they, they uh, Hulu dropped the show, and, you know, he told me what the conversation was. I said, it's okay. But I got 300, 400 people out here want to see me. The show sold out. Mm-hmm. And, he, you know, he's like, I promise I'm going to get it somewhere. And, and when he said that, I felt it in my heart. Mm-hmm. It was going to land somewhere. Yeah. I didn't know it was going to land at BET Plus because I didn't even know BET had a plus. Uh-huh. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm black and I didn't know yeah. that shit. And, and, you're like, a, and you're a plus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be a plus today. I'm hoping I'm their handmaid's tale to like <laughs> it was to Hulu. Right? I mean, or Impractical Jokers on True TV, mm-hmm. all these little channels, all they need is that one you show. Need that one show. Yeah. And I just said, I, I just I just said, you got to learn how to fuck with people who want to mess with you. Yeah. And, and I thought being at BT Plus will understand what we're trying to create. I mean, it's like, do you ever look at TV now and they just keep on rebooting? You're like, people, come on with some new ideas. We're sick of this shit. Right. And the actors, you pulling these people out of bag to ask them to ask them to go do those roles yeah, over. Right, right, right. I don't want to see a reboot. I want to see something new. Right. And but that's all they were I guess just the writers are lazy, Hollywood are lazy. I don't know. Yeah. But if I hear a joke and it was done on TV or something similar, I would stay away from it. Uh-huh. But that's not what you see in today's sitcom. You can literally sit there and 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 and, and do the material because mm. you already heard it from the right, 70s. Right. Like uh, you don't think I see that coming? Yeah, well the problem is is, you know, the networks don't do that many sitcoms anymore and so there's only a couple of them doing it and it's the same people buying and shaping the material. So you're re- you're really getting a point of view of two or three development executives at CBS or NBC, and they're, all their shows end up sounding the same because they give them so many fucking notes. Did you guys get a lot of notes on your pilot? We did. We got some. <laughs> the good thing about, um, with now, I tell you on the pilot, Hulu had great notes. They turned, what we thought we had was really good. Hulu shaped that bitch into what you see now. Okay. So they did a wonderful job with notes and Turning it around. Because, you know, we I never wrote a show. And the young guy, he's only 20. He was only 23 years old straight out of college. Who, the showrunner? Yeah, No, he was the he was the creator. No. Yes. How did you pick him? I didn't pick him. Lee Daniel found him. Damn. Yes, 23 years old. They wasn't going to give him a job. Um, um, nobody believed in him. And I, I sent this kid down. I said, let me talk to you. I said, Hollywood is full of shit. From what I've learned, they're going to take you to nice, fancy dinner, show you shit that they think you ain't never seen. I said, but let me tell you this. I used to steal and forge white people chicks so they can't blow my fucking mind. <laughs> and I told him, I said, they're not going to give you a fucking job. And he's like, but Lee, I said, they're not going to give you a fucking job. I said, but you know why? Because you ain't never did shit. And yeah. this is a city where you need to prove your fucking self. If you ain't or suck the right dick one. Right. I said, so you just got here. Ain't no dicks to suck. Right. So let me show you how to do this. I said, Let's go write a let's go write a let's go write a uh the pilot behind their back. Yeah. And he was like, What? And he was scared that I was gonna take his pilot. And uh-huh. I was like, if you if you don't meet nobody else honest, this is about the honest you gonna get. Yeah. But I, what I wanna steal something for everybody gonna know I ain't right this shit is spelled correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and we wrote a pilot. And wow. that's how he got the job. God damn. What was his background before that? He did a, he did a play at a theater. Okay. And I when Lee found him and I went to the I went to go watch his play at the uh at the public theater. And I was like, I think this kid get me. Yeah. And this kid literally, he just turned into me. I was all, he always, he did, he found interviews I forgot I had done. Okay. He read articles that I he forgot I had done. Yeah. He did everything, everything. Literally, we we'll hear something crazy. When we was in LA shooting a pilot, I was riding in the car, you know, I, I think I'm at, when I'm just running my mouth, I say some of the crazy shit. He would have a notebook writing it down. When we when we got picked up a 10 episode, he pulled out that fucking notebook. Great. No shit. And he was like, he started putting it in the, in the episodes. And I was yeah. like, what the hell you get that from? He said, oh, I write down everything your crazy ass say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you helped him write it then. Well, well, it was 98% of my life. Yeah. 
you, it's, it's easy to write for right. you. All you got to do is listen. Let me go back to your life a little bit because uh, I, I know you, you've done, I'm sure, a ton of interviews and podcasts and talked about your life a lot. But for people that listen to my podcast who might not have heard your story as much, you uh, you grew up in Atlanta mm-hmm. in, in the projects. and Not no project. Y'all stop putting a nigga in the project. Y'all stop putting me in the projects. <laughs> just a ghetto. <laughs> a, just a ghetto, not a project. Yeah, I guess I grew up in New York, so I think of everything as a project. <laughs> yeah, because everything is straight up. Yeah, right, right. No, just a ghetto. Yeah. Get up at the west end of Atlanta. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you you grew up there, and you, uh, you had a baby at 14 and another one at 15. Mm-hmm. And then you took on two other kids who were your sister's kids. Four other kids. kids. Four at, at other kids. 19. At 19. Mm-hmm. And you had no education. What, and, and so you were supporting yourself by selling drugs? Yeah. No, I was supporting myself by selling drugs in the beginning with the 14 and 15 year old. Then I met a man and got married. I got okay. custody of my sister's kids. Right. And then he, had, he didn't have any kids. So right out the back, I'm 19, he's 21, he got six kids. His mama thought he had lost his fucking mind. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's the next sitcom. Ten kids and you're 19? It was six kids and 19. Yeah, because I had two at the time, and I ended up having two by him. Okay, got yeah. it, got so it. So I had my sister four kids, so right out the back, he had six kids. So what it, what is it like at 14 if you're selling drugs as a woman and things get tough? Do you have, like... Do you have people that have your back if there's a fight, if somebody robs you, or is that all oh, on I you? Could fight. It was I all mean, on you. I was you. crazy. Really? I, I should have been a boy. <laughs> yeah? I was I was crazy. I'll fight your ass back. You no know, shit. I was, I mean, I'm from the streets. I was very, I have a, I have a lot of street knowledge. Yeah. I wasn't scared. Because uh-huh. when you're that young, you really don't think you can die. You know, you ain't thinking about dying. You just, right. and, and especially when you're a mom and you're a girl and you have a baby. That motherly instinct for survival mm-hmm. instantly kicks in. It should anyway. Right. And all I know is I had I had I had a daughter at the time, and then I had another. I had a son, and shit got rough. And I knew I had to take care of them, and I knew right. I didn't want them to go through what I went through. And then in between that, which I don't tell a lot, but uh, after my son, I got pregnant again, and I had to get an abortion. Yeah. No, it was it before my son? No, it was before my son. I can't remember the fucking abortion. Somewhere between there, I got an abortion because I had yeah. to become emancipated minor and divorce my mama. You did? Mm-hmm. Why'd you do that? Because she wouldn't pay. Back in the day, you had to have a guardian to go take you to get an abortion. It was oh. after my son. That's right. It was after my son. And I already had two kids, and I was 15, going on 16. And I get pregnant again, and this man is married. And I was like, man, I, got, I can't. I knew Milk was five dollars or four dollars a can. I couldn't afford it. Yeah, I was struggling. I mean, you was literally putting babies on, on shirts and shit with pins in it. And I'm like, I can't get no job. I supposed to be in school. And I'm like, my, we had a caseworker who kind of like looked over our family, and she showed me how to become emancipated minor. So I became emancipated minor, got my own welfare check, moved out of my mama's house, and had an abortion. Damn. And I was grown. I was considered grown. And you were 15. 15. And you had no guy taking care of you. There was nobody like paying well, the I was bills. In, no, I was in a relationship with a married man. He was 22, 23, very abusive. Yeah. But I thought it was the love of my life. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. But no. And then later on, he started to, when he, how I got into selling drugs was because he was a drug dealer. Okay. And he got locked up and they had my fucking rent money. Okay. Because he was helping out with the bills and shit. Uh huh. At first, I wasn't selling drugs. When he went to jail, I'm like, well, shit, I got to pay my rent. So I took my welfare check and bought some drugs, and I doubled it. No shit. Yeah. And how does that work exactly? Like, how do you start? Like, do you just pick a corner and start selling there? Or? Well, when you're from the hood, you hang out around drugs all the time. Crack was so popular back then. They sold it every fucking where. Yeah. So your neighborhood, you just walk out the door, hey, who's smoking? What the, where the junk is at? Yeah. And so I first started in these project called Tech Woods right there in front of Georgia Tech. Uh-huh. And so I figured I was just too many people out there selling drugs. So I went to my old neighborhood to visit one day, and bam, there was uh, my my childhood friend. Brother was like, uh, do you have any crack? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, these fucking junkies out here like zombies. And I was like, oh, my God. I sold like I don't, four, five hundred, maybe a thousand dollars in ten minutes. Yeah, and he was like, "Can you go get some more?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, I can get some more." Shit. And that became my trap, my old neighborhood. So you were selling to people that you grew up with. 
people you knew no because we had moved out of the neighborhood but i, I started okay. a, i started a business with a childhood friend okay yeah wow that's a lot of uh business management that's what people <laughs> don't realize like when i watched uh the wire and he excuse it's me as true. a as a white suburban kid that was my education about selling drugs it's true. And, and I, it's, I hated that show at first my husband loved the wire because he yeah. grew up like christian fire right and um i'm like i don't want to see this drug dealing shit is and then i got into it, i was like oh this shit is real it's real. Really? Only difference is we didn't do as much killing as they did in Baltimore. Okay. I don't remember. The killing came along when the Miami boys came to Atlanta. But I was never involved in killing like that. But drugs, deals, and stuff like that, yeah. All that El Chapo shit, when I watch El Chapo, that I remember when they took all the drugs. It was no drugs in America. Yeah. Like crack cocaine it, i don't know what happened i think they locked up el chapo the first time uh -huh. and it was dry as fuck you okay. couldn't get dope nowhere he really? couldn't get it over here yeah he could not get it over here because they locked his ass up yeah. and then when it started to come back they were shipping it in uh in big trucks tanks so when the crackhead smoked it it would taste like gasoline oh shit. so they fucked up all the dope uh-huh so they had to figure out different ways to get it back over here yeah but I remember that. I can watch some of El Chapo, and I was like, oh, I remember that time right Damn. now. Damn. Yeah. So, But you really kind of have to be a business person at that point. I mean, how, you just paid everything cash. You're, you're, you're buying the crack in cash. You're getting paid in cash. You're paying your rent in cash. You're just... You're There's just, no money orders. You pay your rent in money orders? <laughs> but, you know, you, as a drug dealer, you really don't think about saving. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I got all this money at the house. You just hope I'm not breaking the house and fucking rob you. And, you know, you, you, uh, you young, I'm young, I'm 15, I'm 16, 17. I remember I made my first thousand dollars. I thought I was rich. Uh -huh. I was like, oh my God, I'm rich. Yeah. I'm rich. I got a thousand. I ain't no shit about a hundred thousand dollars. Uh -huh. I just thought that thousand yeah, dollars yeah. was rich. Yeah, right. I'm able to buy all the Jordans and, you know, do all the shit you see them do, go to parties. And, and that's what I did. Yeah. And did you ever smoke crack? Did you I ain't get never involved? Do, I don't do drugs. I don't even drink really. Mm -mm. Wow. I, I grew up in a house where people did not really crack, but they did a lot of marijuana and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just said, I think these fuckers stole me from the hospital. I don't belong in this crazy ass family. All right. So I never felt like, you know, this is where, this is what I want to do. Anything my mama did, I looked at her and said, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Wow. You still have a relationship with her? Uh, yeah, but she did. Oh, she's dead. Yeah, she's been dead a long time. Oh, okay. She died at 39 years old. How did she pass? They say diabetes, but she was small as you. I would say a broken heart, depression. Yeah. Yes, that lady cried from the time the sun came up to it went down. Oh. You... I've never seen that. I think that's why it's hard for me to cry. Yeah. All she ever did, she cried over my stepfather named Curtis because he left her. He was a good man, too. And he left her. And she's like, oh, Curtis left. I said, Mama, he's been gone by seven years. God, damn, you still crying. This is what I'm saying to myself. And I'm a kid. Yeah. He ain't coming back. So it wasn't about Curtis after a while. It was about her having real depression. I think it. I mean, I'm I'm young. I'm a kid. I don't know. I, I probably never heard the word depression. But yeah. I'm just telling you, looking back now, looking at mm. her, the way she cried all the fuck, never happy, right. mean, never happy. You know, just bad relationship after bad relationship. She's in 39 years old, but she carry on like she 80. She was missing her teeth uh -huh. because my daddy knocked her teeth out. She's in very abusive relationships yeah uh just i just think being depressed killed her right, really right being poor we was poor as fuck you know it, i look back at my life and the stuff she would say like the white man holding me down and i'm like what fucking white man there's no white man come around here mm -hmm. and you know <clears throat> for the longest one day i asked her, i said um no, she's like she would say these crackers holding me down. Uh huh. These crackers holding me down, and I'm like, what fucking crackers? So I asked her because I'm a kid. I don't fucking know. I was like, Mama, what did the Keebler elves do to you? <laughs> 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 she slapped the shit out of me. <laughs> I didn't know, bro. I didn't know what I didn't know crackers was white people. But I knew the Keebler Elves yeah. always would try to sell crackers on those commercials. She slapped the shit out of me. <laughs> like, they look so nice. They just want you to buy cookies. <laughs> and they're so little. How can they hurt you? They're like three inches tall. Yeah, and when I when I got older and I realized what she was talking about, I was like, nah, bitch, you just yeah. have a job. Right, right. It was your mindset. So you figured out how to be a mom just on your own. You had no model. There was no like example of the right way to parent 
No, because what you do is you start following what you was taught. Like, I I, uh, I would scream at my kids the way my mama screamed at us. My mama called us bitches and hoes. I have an older daughter that still remember this shit where mm. I would say the same thing to her. Yeah. And when I got married, my husband was like, hey, you can't call your daughter no bitch and hoe. But that's that's all I was called. And so I had to, I started to surround myself with educated people, mm-hmm. people who wanted stuff. Yeah. And I started to learn more how to mully from older women. All my friends, like I'm 49, my friends are probably 58, yeah. 60. You know, all they, everybody had to be older. Right. And this is in Atlanta you met yeah, these Atlanta. women? Mm-hmm. Okay. In Atlanta. And so I just, I just tried to learn from the people that I surrounded myself around. Mm-hmm. You know, like you don't, call, I grew up being called bitches and hoes and, crazy stuff in words and stuff like that but i i don't do it to my kids right right well they don't allow me to do it to them either mm-hmm. my kids don't i say it all day but my kids won't use it my yeah. two girls they won't use the in word how old are they um uh, i have a 20 a 34 year old and I have a 22 year old and where do they live uh both of them live in the 22 year old is home she just graduated with her bachelor's uh and my daughter she does makeup so she's uh she live in indiana too oh nice yeah. She does makeup. Yeah. Like TV and film? She did it for my show. Oh, no shit. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. And my daughter, who's 22, who just got a bachelor's degree, she wrote episode four. I love it. Yeah, that's she wrote. so cool. She's so funny, Gary. Yeah. And I try to tell her, I say, you should really get on stage and do stand up, Gary. Hey, but she don't want to. So I said, well, bring your ass with me and I'm going to get you a writer's job. Uh-huh. And she, you know, she's learning it, but she's really fucking good. Yeah. And she can, li- she watch so much TV. Mm-hmm. She can say, Tyler Perry did that. So, so, so did that. Okay. I saw this here. That's, a- I mean, she watch all TV across right, the board. Right. Like, um, when a t- when the show is about to come out, what is it called? When they have that big opening thing, upfronts. The upfronts. Up she knew oh, what yeah. upfronts. Well, I was okay. like, what the fuck is upfronts? Right. She knew what it was. Right. All, she is a TV fanatic. Yeah. So when I got her, I mean, when when I got the deal on the show, I said, you about to come right on the show. Mm-hmm. And she wrote an episode. It's about non-binary. Am I pronouncing that right? Non-binary. Yeah. Yeah. Because she had a friend like that, the him, them, and she, they, and she, mm-hmm. and she brought the kid to my house one day. And it fucked me up. But it's you got a great premise it. for an episode. Yeah. And so we wrote it. It is so How funny. How did it fuck you up when the friend came over? Because uh, my husband thought she was sneaking a boy in. Uh-huh. And and uh, when we, I started a conversation, I was like, what his, what's his name? What, uh, uh, sir, son, what's your name? And he said, uh, I don't know how the conversation was. He said, trying to tell me he wasn't what, what, a boy. Yeah. He's, I'm dim, dead, and dare. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Goddamn, yeah. we just got over, we yeah. just accept gays and transgender, and there's him, dim, and dare, and yeah, dare. Yeah, So it was a funny conversation. Uh-huh. And when we, when we got the show, we want, I wanted to do an episode on it because it was such a teaching moment right. for me. Mm-hmm. I had never heard of it. Yeah. And so... When 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 it was brought up and I was like Gary, I remember the time you brought your friend over and he told me this and they wrote a fucking episode. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting time in parenting because I'm you know my kids are now my daughter just graduated high school my son's in college and it is a transition from you teaching them everything to sometimes you being taught something. Yes. And I think that's a that's a it's an interesting terrain for a sitcom because usually it's just little kids but to see you have to navigate your relationships with kids and. Um, you're always having to reset it. Like my daughter now is 18. She's got a boyfriend and I have to say to myself, oh, he can go in her room and close the door, I guess, because it's not, she's not 13 anymore. I don't, you know, and, and I have to address her in ways where I'm not schooling her so much as just trying to connect. Yeah. You know, and they don't think I'm cool. No, they don't ever think you cool. They don't think I was ever cool. And it's like, no, no. motherfucker, I was way cooler than you, you will ever be. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know? We did an episode on um, derogatory words, you know, like the N word, uh, uh, Jap slap. You ever heard of Jap Never slap? Never heard of Jap slap. Uh, most people haven't. It's a. Uh, it's a derogatory word uh, for, for Japanese people, but they ended up taking it out and replacing it with the word chinks. I'm quite sure you heard that. They put that in the episode? Yes. Wow. It's it's all about words we shouldn't use. Yeah. But it's like when you're old school, you're used to doing stuff cer- a certain way, but times have changed so much yeah. that 
uh, the kids are telling you, hey, you can't say that no more. So my kids tell us what we can and can't say in this episode. Right. And it's always a teaching moment. Yeah. And it's not a teaching moment about, hey, white people, I want to teach you something. It's a teaching moment about life. Yeah. About life, period. Right. And it, was a, it, was, it wasn't an easy episode to write because, I mean, I always said, I use derogatory terms and, you know, everybody use crazy shit at the house. Yeah. And my kids like, you can't say the F word. The mm-hmm. F-A-G word. I'm like, well, we've been saying it. Hell, Eddie Murphy had it in his special. Mm-hmm. But you can't say that anymore. Yeah. And so you saw how I opened the show with a monologue. Yeah. I open every show like that. Uh-huh. And it tells you the monologue takes you into the show. Yeah. About Here's the, the theme that we're going to talk mm-hmm. about. Here's the theme we're going to talk about. Right. Right. Yeah. I know Dame, uh, Matt Damon is in trouble because he said he used to say the word fag. And yeah. uh, and he's getting backlash on that, that his daughter had to tell him not to say it and he stopped saying it. Di- it's exactly that. But that's, this is why this show is so important because net, regular network TV is not going to let you push the envelope like yeah. that. They're too scared. What's going to happen is once this take off, great, everybody's going to like, I want a fat black woman like me and Pat who that's talk right. about some real shit that's because right. that's what they do. Yep. It's a copycat. Yeah. You got it. I got to get it too. So mm-hmm. my network can have their version of it. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, we pushed it. That, that comes a lot from the kid who helped me create. Sometime I told him, I was like, uh, excuse me, this is a comedy. We did an episode about my kid's father coming back, who got me pregnant, uh-huh. which was fucking hilarious. But by the end, you was in tears. So sometime I had to ask the guy who created the show, I said, uh, is this a comedy or yeah, fucking drama? Because right. I don't know what the fuck you got me doing on this Right, stage. right. But it was so... I did an episode about my sister being on drugs because you saw my sister in the show. Uh-huh. And everything is, is about 98%, 95% to 98% real to my life, every wow. episode. Yeah. I mean, the comedy versus drama, there's so many shows that are on TV right now that don't declare one or the other. They mm-hmm. just, you know, you watch Fleabag or you watch uh, Orange is the New Black. And, you know, there's shows that can combine the drama with the comedy. And, that, and with a life like yours, I think it would cheapen it to only make it funny. Yes. To miss out on those opportunities to explore those real relationships. And I think that's great. We let a clip go um, that was in the uh, trailer and the daughter said, the daughter said, you uh, you know how hard it was to watch Lloyd beat you and you fight all the women that uh, whatever. And then I said, you you didn't have to watch. You could have helped the bitch out. Hey. And people lost their fucking mind. Yeah. Oh, that's not funny. Oh, that's bringing the black community down. And so I'm yeah. arguing on TikTok yesterday. I said, bitch, get, I said, you self-hating motherfuckers. I have to talk back, Greg. I got to yeah. learn not to yeah. talk back. I'm like, if I'm bringing the, commu- the black community down, what the fuck is Chicago doing? Yeah. Which pissed me off. You know, because uh-huh. I'm like, you you judging a whole show off of a clip. Mm-hmm. You don't know anything about this woman. You don't know her journey. You don't know how real this is. But you want to say, because I had a real conversation that a real black mama and a black daughter, no matter who the fuck color you are, mm-hmm. that probably had, you losing your fucking mind? Mm-hmm. People are crazy. Yeah, I know. They ain't ready, Greg. They're not ready, but there's a big they. There's a lot of they's. You know, there's the people that are ready. There's the people that are opening their minds up to like, you know, that there's uh, there's issues in this country that we have to deal with in a real way. Mm-hmm. And I think there's people that are reading books and they're looking to watch TV shows like this because maybe they live in all white neighborhoods in Indianapolis and and they're curious and they and they need an authentic voice to teach that and then there's the people that are going to react to you and you just keep fighting them you just keep saying well you know what this is my fucking life so I'm not going to apologize for it I tell them that every night on stage yeah and I tell some crazy dark stories that's Mm. funny yeah I tell them I said well you can take the darkest shit in your life and you can laugh at it that's when you know you got control of it right I said when you ashamed when you're ashamed of what you've been through, then you're still dealing with that. Mm-hmm. I, I, this lady hit me up on, on Facebook the other day, and I said, damn, she looked familiar. So she said, do you remember me? Uh, she called me Rabbit. That was my street name. And I said, I kind of. She said, we, we did time in jail for, doing, for selling drugs. No shit. But I bumped into her six years ago at a beauty supply store. And I was like, don't I know you? She's like, we was in jail together. I was like, well, how you been doing? Ever since we got out of jail, she's like, don't say that. My kids don't know I've been in jail. I said, well, why the fuck not? Uh. What the fuck are you ashamed of? Mm-hmm. You Let them know what you've been through so they don't make that same fucking mistake. You ain't got to sit up here and act like you know perfect mom. Ain't nobody perfect. Yeah. 
nobody. So why are you playing? Uh-huh. And so I lost contact with her. And just the other day, she hit me up. Mm-hmm. And and she's like, we was in jail together. And now I tell my kids all those stories oh, okay. about how when we was in jail and we confided in each other. I was like, uh-huh. oh, you got over it. Yeah. Because you're too busy worrying about what society going to think of you. Right. Fuck society. Right. Fuck everybody out there. Well, that's the thing about stand-up comedy is it really is this place where you can take the thing, like I always thought the recipe for me to write a good bit is what would I be embarrassed to tell my best friend? All yeah. right, now walk up on stage and say it and then see what happens and find a way to make it funny because that that tension of being ashamed, like I went into the woods, like I didn't think I was gay when I was in college, but I, I, I was like very hypersexual and I used to sleep with a lot of different women and three ways and one night stands and like constant and uh and then I was like into David Bowie and Iggy Pop and, and Mick Jagger, and they were all fucking around with being gay. And I was like, yeah, maybe I should try that just to see. Who knows, you know? And so I had it in my head that, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try it once. And so I'm walking down the street one night. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. I was stumbling drunk. And I look in across the street from my apartment in Boston. is this area called the Fenway, which is a woods where gay guys go for anonymous cell. Every city's got like a wooded area downtown that was built for anonymous gay sex. And it happens to be across (laughs) the street from my apartment. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, do I go in? Should I go in? So I walk in and I look around and this guy pops out from behind a tree, like this magical gay elf. He just appears like, here, here I am. I'm the guy. Uh, Come get this dick. Come get this dick. (laughs) And he unzips his fly and he pulls the dick out. And I look at it and then he reaches and he pulls his balls out. And I just look at it and I go, man, that is the most ridiculous looking thing I've ever seen in my life. And I was just like, there's no way I'm sucking that. And I just pushed him. I got scared because now I'm alone in the woods in the dark with this guy whose dick is out. And I I pushed him and he fell over and then he ran off into the woods with his dick flopping around. I walked out and I, I told that story to my wife 10 years ago. I had never told a human being that story. And then I told my wife and we were at dinner with, with another couple. And they were fucking pounding the table. They were laughing. I, I told a 10-minute version of the story. They were laughing. I went on Howard Stern the next week, and I told that story. And it fucking crushed it. It was like the best moment I've ever had on the Howard Stern show. Wow. Yeah. See, that's what it is. I mean, because it's different. Yeah. Who else been in a little fair land woods? And then they was like, I'm going to go suck a dick. And then the dick, oh, no, I ain't going to suck that dick. I changed my mind. Put your dick away. <laughs> Maybe if he had unbuckled the top and pulled the whole thing out and presented it properly, I might have gone down on that dick. But no, it didn't look right. It didn't look right. <laughs> I don't think you were going to go down on that dick. Because <laughs> I think time he popped it out, you're like, uh, no, I ain't going to be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to suck a fairy dick. <laughs> I know. I want another straight guy. I want my best friend. That'd be that'd be more casual. <laughs> Maybe so, but he wasn't yeah. in the woods that night, <laughs> and he probably didn't know about the fairy the fairy woods you was at. <laughs> it's like trying spicy. Ooh, I don't think I want to do that shit again. <laughs> like I don't, I want to eat that house to pudding. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I've never been drunk enough to say I want to eat a pudding. Because I know what my pussy go through. And I don't like my pussy. Okay? I've seen my draws. I've seen what my pussy do to my draws. And I'm not fucking with my draws. Okay? I've had my finger in there and I've smelled it. But yeah. No mouth needs to go no, on that. I ain't even put my finger in there. I'm just saying. Now, hell, I feel sorry for the tissue that you have to put down there. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't doing it. I'm not doing it. That's why I told my daughter, who's gay, I said, if you eat pussy like your real daddy do, you are a hero. <laughs> you want a what? I told her, I said, if you eat pussy like your real daddy do, you are a hero. <laughs> she loves to eat pussy. I don't know what's down now that she discovered like a motherfucking uh, little, uh, uh, leprechaun, but she loves pussy. I said, child, <laughs> more power to you. It's just that ain't my that ain't my forte of meat, okay? <laughs> Shit. When it come to that, I'm a vegan. <laughs> hmm. I ain't eating that shit. <laughs> How did she tell you that she was gay? Uh, my mother-in-law told me she was gay. When oh she yeah, was a girl. She told me she had a click licking spirit. And, uh, uh, my mother-in-law told me that when she was about seven years old. I was like, "Shut the fuck up." When she was seven? Yeah, she was like, "This baby got a click licking spirit." No shit. And uh, you know, you in denial. 
Right. But uh, she went out to college. I yeah. mean, I kind of saw some signs here and there, but she went uh-huh. out to college. Yeah. And um, where most of them come out at. And then she just kept, like, running away, keep from coming home. And then it finally, you know, I hadn't seen her in, like, two, three years. I said, look here. you." Uh, this, she knew I didn't like gay women either because I've been to prison. Yeah. So I said, Ashley, are you gay? She was like, yes. I said, well, come on back to Atlanta. You eat a lot of pussy down here. <laughs> Everybody down here eating pussy in Atlanta. <laughs> at least you have a place to stay. At least you got to be homeless. <laughs> come on home and eat pussy. <laughs> 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 they say the devil is coming down to Georgia anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. <laughs> Eat some Georgia pussy. Yeah, come on. Eat now. a peach, right? Isn't and, that the state motto? Eat and, a peach. And that's what she been doing. Eating everything <laughs> that moves down in that motherfucker. <laughs> she like a sushi <laughs> buffet. <laughs> you know, I don't even think she eat sushi, but she eat pussy. I'm like, uh, <laughs> this don't go together. <laughs> don't you like that shit? Uncooked and cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah, she gay as fuck she she suck more pussy than my sons them do <laughs> i think she be teaching her brothers how to eat pussy that's a lot of mercy. oh yeah she, she knows better she knows better than a man does right because yeah, she she's does. got one and she keep them dicks on deck yeah yeah she keep them little cold dicks i call them cold dicks Dildos? Yeah. Yeah. They ain't got no heat to them. (laughs) (laughs) I call them them room temperature dicks. You know what to get her for Christmas, right? I'm not buying nobody no dicks, okay? (laughs) If she want a dick, she better get a dick that connected to some heat. (laughs) Better get a real dick. (laughs) A dick that can pay your rent. Yeah, because them pussies do not be paying her rent. She go out and get the sorriest fucking lesbian. I said, ain't the whole purpose of being gay is to have money? Yeah, You go out here and get these bitches, the bitches that you get, you can go out and get a sorry ass man. (laughs) At least the sex is good. Everybody know unemployed black men's got the best dick. Because like, they're you know, not working? They got all that extra energy? Yeah, they yeah. got time to practice and play the video game. <laughs> Fuck these shit out of you when you come home. I'm like, you wasting your talent. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't gay for no reason. That's true. When you're gay, you get to be rich because you got you got no kids you're dealing with. You, you got two incomes. Rich gay people got the I used to think gay people had the best life. Yeah. They go on trips. They go they to don't brunch. Have no kids. They go yeah. to brunch. They don't give a fuck. They right. buy houses. They they plant flowers. Uh-huh. You ever see a gay couple? They so fucking happy. Yeah. They got their little dog with the outfit on. <laughs> they're so fucking they always look like they wildflowers. Yeah. They always look like the hippies from the 70. Yeah. I am having a great fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> you rarely see a sad gay people. <laughs> Couples anyway. They're happy as fuck. Yeah, they are. I'm like, what? You are the most yeah. poet gay I ever seen in my life. <laughs> Fuck. Just you fucking up. You fucking up. You fucking up the gay community. Come on back to the straight community. <laughs> you don't even have a super legacy outback. What's wrong with you? Yes. <laughs> She just, oh, just oh, that's oh, funny. struggling. Does, does she have long relationships or just Hell one night no. stands? Just one night no, stands. No, not one night stands. She's go with them about a year, but they always yeah. pieces of shit. Really? I, I don't think I ever, maybe a one or two I like. Uh-huh. But every time I like when she get rid of them, it lasts about a year. Are they hot? Hell no. <laughs> they look like LeBron James. <laughs> <laughs> Shaq. <laughs> you tell her that? Yeah, I'm like, where you kidding the old boy bitches from? <laughs> Some of them look tougher than my husband, and they brought like, what the fuck? She had one girl, this girl was so unattractive, and I was like, I see why she gay. Yeah. I don't know a man that'll fuck up. Uh-huh. She's on the right team. Uh-huh. Oh, my God, she looked like a construction worker, and she looked like, oh, I can't even... I'm trying to think of a real dark-skinned, ugly man. She was so unattractive that when she walked in, I thought she was a boy. Yeah. And I told Ash, I said, they got to be the ugliest girl I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And, that, and that, so she, is she the feminine one in the group? Yeah, but they, but she act like she the man because uh-huh. she always talking about her scrap on. So I don't even ask her. Because she what? what? Always talking about her scrap on. Yeah. She always talking about she oh, dicking the bitches. Scra- I thought you said strap on. Because that may be involved too. 
She always talking about her strap on. The yeah. dick that she strap on. Yeah, yeah. Like a girdle. Yeah, like yeah. The old women used to wear their girdles. Uh huh. So I don't know how the fuck they put them on. Oh shit. I just I, I just know I eat out pl- paper plates at her house because she used to put her dildos in the dishwasher. <laughs> And I don't be, I'm not going to eat, drink out no cup with no spinning vagina juice on the fucking rim. Mm-mm. <laughs> Why is there a hair in the soup bowl? This is, yeah. uh, that's funny. She's really gay. Yeah. So. Well. But more power to her, as long so, as she be happy. I'm just glad that she's gay. Yeah. Because if she was straight, and this much of a hoe, she had nine thousand children left. Yeah, right. Me. That's true. So, but you know, the good thing less than less venereal diseases, probably. I don't know what a pussy do now. I don't know about that. She yeah. gonna tell me that. But I can tell you this: the the, the worst thing she's done that I've seen when she leave behind a relationship, they all, she'll go and adopt a pet with the girl, uh-huh. and then they all go with the dog like they're in a relationship, yeah. or she'll just run off and leave the animal. Uh-huh. And I'm like, you a deadbeat dad? Yeah. A mama, whatever the fuck you is right. in a relationship. Right. I said, stop adopting the animal with these fucking girls that you ain't going to stay with. Like Ellen DeGeneres. Remember, she tried to give that puppy, she tried to uh, give a puppy back after she adopted it. And it was a big headline that she, uh, yeah, it was a big deal. Because she wanted to get a dog back? She adopted a dog because of a relationship and that, that happened. And she wanted to return it to, uh, no, she gave it to somebody else. So... In the Hollywood world, if you adopt a dog, you have to return it to the pet agency that you adopted it from. She gave it to a friend of hers, and it came out, and the pet adoption place made a big stink out of it, and she cried on on her show and apologized. Yeah. I would have been saying, what the the fuck? Yeah. Is that what they do to rich people? They're not mm-hmm. ready for me. I'm like, well, you come get the goddamn yeah, dog. Yeah. My friend got him. It ain't like I let him go on the expressway. <laughs> You had like I let the motherfucker yeah, go and threw him right. in a brown paper sack bag down the hill or some yeah, shit. Right. I just didn't want him no more because we done broke up, so I gave him to my friend who wanted him. Yep. Probably in a mansion. If it's a friend of Ellen's, it's probably rich. Yeah. yeah. You I ain't, you had like I dropped this motherfucker off in the hood yeah, or some shit. Yeah. This dog got more health care than you do. <laughs> go fuck yourself, Peter. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm not ready for them to come after me. No. Are you going to move to Hollywood if this show? I would never move to Hollywood. Where does the show shoot? It shoots in Atlanta. It's oh, based out of Indiana. All right. There you go. Yeah, it shoots in Atlanta. It's based out of Indiana. So where do you live when you're filming the show? I live, uh, I get a place in Atlanta, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, in a, I'm in a mix of trying to buy a house to move back home. You're going to move back to Atlanta? Yeah, I love Atlanta. No shit. I hate Indiana. Wow. Indiana been great to me, but though. I yeah. mean, I love my fan base. They, it's my second home, but I like the South, baby. Yeah. I don't like no snow in my weed. Uh-huh. I like diversity. I'm a I'm a diehard Falcon fan. I'm a Georgia peach. I want to be in Atlanta. That's where my friend's at. You friends with T.I. and Tiny? I am free, uh, friends with T.I. and Are Tiny. You? Yeah. I wrote it. I wrote a, I write for TV shows, and I, I write for a lot of black shows. And so I wrote a show. I was a showrunner for uh, Tiny Tiny Tonight. It was a talk show that she did. And uh, I spent some time at their house. Holy shit. What? They live. They're not still together, are they? Yeah, they still are together. Are they really? Uh-huh. Whenever they go on a trip, their house, I don't know if you've been to their house, but it's lined with suitcases. Just open suitcases filled with clothes. This one's got white t-shirts. This one's got sneakers. This one's got shoes. This one's got underwear. And when they pack, they just zip everything up, and they have like three SUVs that take all the suitcases to the airport. They spent, somebody told me they spent $20,000 in baggage fees in one year just traveling. Wow. Isn't that crazy? But that, she's she's sweet. I love Tiny. She's a character. I love both of them. They came to my birthday party. Oh, did they really? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. They he's a great gay they're a great couple. I go over to their house sometime on Sundays. Uh-huh. They they play cards. Yeah. They like to play spade. So when I'm in town, I I'm like, Hey, y'all playing cards? Uh-huh. I wanna drop by. And he have a she have a chef. I'm learning that's what rich people do. Uh huh. You, you get know, a me, chef. Yeah, you get a chef. Me personally, me and my motherfucking daughter gonna be up in there cooking. Yeah, you know? right. But I don't cook, but I'm gonna be up there passing her the salt and pepper because uh-huh. they don't allow me to cook. <laughs> but they had a chef and we played uh-huh. cards and drinks. I was on there at like three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I text him every now and then. He's, he's a good guy. That's I awesome. I really like him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Atlanta is an exciting place. I've spent a lot of time there and, uh, it's a place that, um, you know, is a good alternative to shooting shows. There's so much, 
there's good background actors, there's good crews, they've got directors, it's all there, you know, yeah. and you don't have to deal with L.A. No, you don't. We flew a few people in from L.A. Uh -huh. uh, we, Kim Fields uh, directed the last two episodes. Yeah. Uh, uh, directed by the name of Lenny. Um, uh, what is the other guy? Osterwich? No, Lenny. Yeah. Lenny, I, I can't think of Lenny last name. Okay. But we had quite a few good directors. They all came from L.A. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's great. So it was it was pretty good. I mean, we flew in a few people, but like you said, Atlanta got a lot of act actors and actresses, mm -hmm. so we could pick from right there. Yeah. So the principal on the show, we flew him in uh -huh. um, because he was needed. And um, the secretary, they thought she wasn't needed, but I was like, yes, the fuck she is. And they didn't want to get her in, Greg. I called her up. I said, hey, I need you to say you live in Atlanta. <laughs> work local work as a local hire yeah and come on in through here right right mm -hmm. she fucking nailed it oh you the, should what see was the it what were the three names that she uh -huh. said <laughs> i can't even remember <laughs> whatever your daughter's name is she nailed it it was so funny thank you yeah thank she's you. good and I try to tell people all the time, it's, it's not a black story. It's not a black family. It's an American story. Yeah. If you look at it, we're talking about, I know you only seen the pilot, but, you know, it, I, we, I was hoping to make sure it didn't feel like we was trying to make a point of view. It's just, an, it's a family. Right. That's in a white neighborhood. Yeah. And I just wanted people to understand right. my point of view from that. It's a fish out of water sitcom. That's yeah. all. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen. There's other. I could talk to you all day, but I don't want to. I don't want to keep you up. But um, the show is on BET Plus. It it premieres on August 12th. Um, Norman Lear loved it so much. He sent this nice uh, message to yes, he did. to somebody, and they and it's to on the, the to internet. To the creator, to the uh, one of the, the co-creator. Oh, okay. Um, and then uh, also, if you want to check out her special, uh, Netflix is The Degenerates. She see her do her stand up comedy, which is what brought her to this place. It's the girl that brought you to the dance, and you'll keep <laughs> dancing with her no matter what. I'm sure. Stand up is first for me, Greg. Right, because this is the only thing I can control. They can take this TV shit back a thousand times, but I can control this stand up. Right, hell, I can go do a show in the bar as long as I got fans. That's right, and the, and the podcast, same thing. Yep, same thing. Nobody tells you what to say, what to do, mm -mm. and uh, and it, 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 here's a sign of that is. August 12th, the night the show premieres, most people would be having a fucking fancy party and T.I. and Tiny would be there. You're going to be at the uh, House of Comedy in Bloomington, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stage. I got bills to pay. I ain't got time to be <laughs> sipping and acting like I'm famous. <laughs> my, <laughs> my hair just like, you a celebrity? I said, bitch, I am going to work. Yeah. You a celebrity. I'm yeah. going to work, yeah. okay? Yeah. I'm not a fucking celebrity. Stop calling me a celebrity. I am a comedian. I am going to work. Yeah. Fuck this fame shit. This shit is shot. I'm on to the next day. Mm -hmm. Right. And you enjoy it. See all those Emmys up there? I wasn't. Oh. At, I wasn't at any of those ceremonies. I was. I was at. I was on stage at the fucking what comedy attic, uh, writing. Let me hold one. Can I see? Yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Here you go. What was it for? I wrote on Ellen. Oh wow! Yeah, Yo, I am actually holding the M, and your ass ain't even dusted off. I know. Daytime. Oh, you wrote on Ellen. Yeah. How about that, huh? A real fucking Emmy. Yeah, it's a little dusty. I'll so take you know, a picture with you with it yes. after the show. And you could say, this is going to be me in a year. <laughs> if you want to see her perform live, Comedy on State, August 5th through 7th. House of Comedy in Bloomington, August 8th, 12th through 15th. City Winery in Atlanta, going back to Atlanta on August 21st. Canceled. That's canceled. Yeah, don't say that one. All right. Take that one out. August 26th through 29th, Improv in Pittsburgh, and then in Chicago, and then in Maryland. Go to MsPatComedy.com for tickets and other dates. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can check out the Pat Down podcast with our friend Dion, Dion Curry, who I'm going to be with next weekend. Yay! Yeah, he's the best. Um, he is. All right, well, listen, thanks for your time. I'm so happy for you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for finally meeting, goddammit. I know, I know. It's nice. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. All right, we'll do it again soon. We sure will. Thank you, Greg. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>